thank you again for joining me. Um, so first of all, um, my name is Anita Bakken, for those who don't know me, and I'm the head of events here at Stream Labs. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we currently stand on, um, carrying meat on, the Gadigal people of the Yoruba Nation, and also pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. Emerging. So those who aren't familiar with Tankstream Labs, we are a co-working space for tech startups uh, with a global focus. Now we started in about 20 on in 2012 when Tim Fung, who is a co-founder and CEO of Etasca, wanted a place for him and his entrepreneurial friends to actually work out of. So that's how Tankstream Labs was born as a co-working space back in 2012. Now we currently exist to support the growth and innovation of the startup ecosystem. And we have three offices across Australia, so two in Sydney and one in Perth. So we're actually coming live to you now via our office at Bridge Street in Sydney. So today you're joining us um, in our global startup series um, session on how to take your startup global. Now the format for today, like I said, is the 60 minute session here um, with the panelists. And if you have any questions for those in front of me, please raise your hand if you have any questions throughout. And those who are watching online, you're able to ask questions through the Q&A box on the Zoom up there as well. So we shall get started with introductions and no one else, no one better to introduce themselves than themselves. <laughs> so Nick, I'll get you to just introduce yourself, full name, job title, um, company, and tell us a little bit about your role as well. Please. Sure. So I'm, I'm Nick Roberts. I'm one of the co-founders of a business called Scolari Partners. Uh, we invest in, um, passionately invest in and actively advise um, early stage um, technology businesses. Um, it, we look to make 10 to 12, 10 to 12 investments a year. Um, it typically it very founder led our model, We're very interested in technology and, and very interested in the international and global growth, which is um, one of the things we're talking about here today. From a personal perspective, I've, um, I've been on the entrepreneurial journey a number of times, um, has led me around the world. So I've set up businesses in the US, UK, um, Australia, obviously, and all, all across Asia. So I've seen, um, I've seen, I've seen a lot of ups and a few downs from that as well. I'm sure we'll touch on we'll touch on some of those um, today. But you know, very passionate, and very fortunate to have, uh, to have had the global experience I have. Fantastic, and thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Last year. Hi everyone. I'm last year, I work for Austrade as a senior advisor for Scale Up programs, and that includes the Landing Pads program, which some of you may be familiar with. And basically, I'm involved across program design, strategy, and also delivery. And for those who aren't familiar with the Landing Pads program, basically, we have landing pads in San Francisco, Singapore, Shanghai. Tel Aviv and Berlin, and these help startups enter the region and also provide some critical market education and insight. And so at Australia, I'm backed by a large global network of market specialists in our various offices around the world. So we're well positioned to provide startups with on the ground insights. And in addition to uh, running the Learning Pads program, um, obviously you might be wondering how we've been doing that in the first instance amid COVID, given that it's a market entry program, like many other businesses, we've pivoted to virtual, and that means that we've been offering virtual support, advice, and programming. For example, virtual boot camps over the past year or so, we've had about nine boot camps, which have had about 110 companies participating. And we've also provided tailored services one to one to startup clients and you may have also heard recently the Australian federal government has uh, provided about 9.6 million in funds to support fintech related trade and investment programs, particularly. So you may also see, well, you will definitely also see more in that space from us. So yeah, watch this space. All right, fantastic. Sounds like a lot is happening. <laughs> a lot is happening. Great. And David? Hello, I'm David Kenny. I'm a partner at the Chadwick Kenny firm called Chadwick. I've been really fascinated by this space for the last 20 years in the ecosystem, having worked with lots of universities and helped companies commercialize their products, uh, go overseas, go and find capital, go and find the right partners to collaborate with and commercialize their, their operations and hiring people, etc. Um, so it's become a bit of an obsession, even more so in the last 10 years, and working with a lot of accelerators and writing a book around it, launching a podcast called Sanity Check. Uh, just because I believe that uh, founders need a few real key resources that will essentially help them get through that $100 million revenue uh, 
target, uh, if it is a target for people, great. Uh, and that's really what I obsess with is trying to work out those five things, those five key elements that really make the difference. And in the course of that, uh, the firm does a lot of work with accounting and tax and advisory and flip up. So we've probably worked with about seven or eight uh, companies and been flipped up through the Y Combinator process. So the best of the best companies that I've dealt with on, on, I think we've raised lots and lots of money. We've been involved with teams that have IPO in Australia, Stock Exchange, NASDAQ, um, raised capital for probably uh, you know, most of the, the top 20 uh, VCs in Australia and some overseas. So, yeah, I feel like um, it's, a, it's an area I'm really passionate about. I've been working a long time uh, and, and always trying to put the founders first and give them a bit of a sanity check sometimes. Sometimes people don't want to hear things. Um, but you know, surrounding um, them with things that they need and content, information, connections, and, uh, and some tough love sometimes. And that's really uh, an important part of how I see my role. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, as you guys can see today, we have an expert panel on you. So I just want to set the scene a little bit before we go into the questions with our panelists here today. So when we're running in a startup or a founder starts his own um, business, the ultimate goal is not only to make revenue, but to expand. And that expansion may include expanding and scaling up into global markets. So being in Australia and remote from the rest of the world, we have pros and cons um, of our physical distance as well. So larger, you know, we're physically distant from larger economies such as Europe and America, um, but that also means also bear less of the brunt of financial global or global crises like the COVID pandemic, right? But when I hear today to talk about COVID, although it's very tempting, um, but you might see it slipped into the conversation a little bit, but that is not the focus of today. So today we're here to talk about how to take your startup global. So we have expertise uh, from a startup and business consultant in David, an international trade and investment expert, Elasia, and Nick, who's founded businesses in USA, UK, and Asia as well. So let's start with the why first. And I'll start with you, Nick. So why do startups want to go global? Why did you go global? So I think the, I mean I think the most obvious answer is is really around addressable markets, isn't it? You you can by 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 entering new markets, you you increase the size of the market you can target and you increase your growth. And it's it's often always often often about growth for the early stage of businesses. So um, it's all about growth, you know, that can, there's clearly a close connection there between uh, people's investment plans, funding plans, valuation plans, obviously by, by creating a bigger addressable market and, and hopefully proving you can sell into it, you can make your business more valuable as well. Um, in terms of the drivers for me personally, the business that I've been involved in, um, you know, I think one that's worth calling out is actually, um, is actually the pull from customers. So, so I was in a business where we were servicing uh, enterprise global clients in, in a certain market in the UK um, and because we we're doing a pretty good job we found pretty quickly that client was turning around to us saying we need this in the US as well so that can be you know that can be quite a natural way to enter a new market is when a client pulls you in it's quite a good way as well because you know you've got a you know you've got a customer there um, you know the second area from a, a business I was involved in was probably slightly more strategic um, so we recognized that we had a, a an opportunity to solve you know, what was really a very different local um, challenge in our industry across across Asia. So it was actually wasn't there was no real commonality there. <clears throat> um, so we saw the opportunity to solve that problem in a number of different locations, uh, knowing that that's going to become very valuable for someone at the end of the day, which is uh, which is exactly what happens. So you do the hard you do the hard yards to work out how to, to enter a bunch of markets, and someone's probably going to come and pay you premium to to to, to save them having to do that work. So there's a couple of different things that can drive you in that. Right. And did you when you started out though, was your original goals or aspirations to go global, or was that just a natural progression? Yeah, I think I think it, I think it was. I mean, I think the timing of the global can. I, I think that's you know probably one of the points is you, you might think it's going to happen at a certain point, and you either get pulled there quicker because a customer pulls you there, which yeah. has its challenges. Um, you know, or, or actually, from the case of the second business talked about, we were very clear that was our strategy uh, to build that. We were very clear about who we thought would be valuable to. It's one of the it's one of those nice examples in the startup where. Um, you lay out a plan and it broadly happens as you expect. And, you know, I'm sure lots of stuff didn't. Um, it doesn't always work that way. But in, yeah. that, in that case, we kind of figured it out and that was the, was the goal. Great. And 
to you, David. I mean, you're very active in the startup scene. And you, you, you know, you dabbled in a lot of things, including the podcast as well. Great podcast, by the way. Sanity check. Got to check it out. Um, but why? What are the reasons that you've seen that with the startups that you work with? What are their reasons as to why they want to go global? I oh, just think following on what you, you mentioned, which is totally true. The, the main thing is is really the proximity to market, but there's just talent overseas as well. Not to say there's not talent in Australia, but there's just more people. And, and uh, whilst the community in Australia is, is very vibrant, there's uh, and Sydney and Melbourne uh, in particular are doing a pretty good job, but there's just so much more and they're so much further ahead. So it's the proximity to people that have started having exits in some of the, uh, the larger tech companies and that they want to do something again. So just a bigger pool of people, uh, more resources in terms of capital, um, and then being able to get into the market now is just so much easier than I want to say 20 years ago. You had to fly over and find accommodation and all those sorts of things. Now there's people on the ground that will help you with accommodation, put you up on a couch. Um, the resources are just so much more developed and so it's happening at a rate of knots and there's so much more information on if you've got a, a, a fintech company or you've got a fashion tech or you've got a med tech uh, the information is so much more readily accessible so it's happening more often and more frequently uh, the market the cost to enter the market's a lot less um, and we're seeing some really good results from people finding those right channels so it's happening but there's still lots of challenges and it's not easy competing over there in some ways but uh, and it's also not the only market you go to it's like a lot of people you've got to go to the us and uh, do you you know there's so many other choices to go to as well it's uh, it depends on what you need what you're building and where you are where your people will be so yep. it's assessing that i think is a key thing for most uh, people to, to work those uh, issues through and do you think another reason could be because, like you mentioned, the Australian market, we may be a little bit more immature um, to, you know, our mar the markets in, say, America or in Europe. Do you think that rings true? Well, look, there's some unbelievably smart people here. It's like, this uh, is very clear. Uh, but, look, there's just more of people over there. And you can only, even, you know, the angel investor community, there's, there's some really great angel investors that are smart and build stuff. Um, but there's just so much more, like there's just more, everyone in a cafe in San Francisco is probably a founder of an angel investor, whereas it's, it's just, it's more, it's just so much more than the, the volume is there. And, uh, so just having, you know, the, the more developed system, uh, they've, they've been out longer, it just makes it a slightly harder, a slightly easier to get into. Yeah. Uh, but good people can make it anywhere, like it doesn't matter if you're in Sydney or in San Francisco or wherever, oh. like good people will make it, make it through. So if they can find you know, access to the things they need at the right stage, even better, and then Sydney's done a great job. Uh, I'll never say a, a negative word about Sydney, I love Sydney. We have a great city here. We have a great city here. <laughs> hey, it's, it's stopped raining today, which is amazing. Um, we've got some sun on the way down here. So as I said, to me, it's really just getting the founders in front of the people they need to help them with whatever they're stuck on, whatever their main challenge is. And, and there's just more proximity to, you know, even some of the venture capital firms, there's just more of them. And yeah. so there's portfolio brothers and sisters that are in the trenches and helping each other. There's just more of them. Yeah. And, and that's, so therefore the resources are there. But that doesn't stop people here interacting anyway. So the world's are so small these days. Yep, that's true. Um, and last year, so you help startups scale and grow internationally. What are the main reasons that you've seen startups go global? So I think we have some pretty incredible R&D in Australia. And I think startups, which have highly innovative products, they often want to go abroad early to capture first mover advantages in markets where the opportunity for their business is not so populated with competitors or where the opportunity isn't yet fully tapped. So I think that can be a big driver. In addition, sometimes the opportunity for a particular business is just overseas. I'll give you an example. There's a Brisbane-based company called Illum, and they have created a COVID home test kit. And now the FDA issued emergency approval to this test kit, and they've been able to sell that into the US market where there has been a great need for testing. Whereas 
guess in Australia that solution isn't really in market. It's a great Aussie invention, but really the public health system and I guess the uh, public health led PCR testing has been able to meet demand in Australia under the current pandemic situation. So yeah, sometimes it sometimes it is a matter of advantages gained from going abroad, and sometimes it's also a matter of necessity for yeah. a particular product or particular opportunity. Yeah, that's a great yeah. point. A really good point to raise there. Um, now, obviously, each startup is different, but there are, there are some common considerations that startups need to take when they're going global, right? Um, or when they're entering a foreign market as well. So, David, I'll start with you this time. What are some key considerations startups need to think of when they're expanding their business internationally? First of all, not break the law. So, like, making sure you understand what market you're in, what the laws are, and, and even something as silly as the US isn't one market as well. Um, so, attracting, um, getting, getting off the ground running with, you know, getting into the country legally so that you're not stopped and you can't ever get a like a, a visa um, by doing the wrong thing initially. Um, getting some good advice around. Uh, how do you start? How do you get structured? Do you set up subsidiaries or flip ups to um, raise capital? Getting that right and then understanding how, how are we then going to interact in those countries? Yeah. Are we going to sell our product from the Australian company, the US company? Uh, what are we going to charge for it? How do we not uh, get arrested at LAX because we're doing you know, transfer pricing wrong? How do we get our model right with uh, making sure that our costs are as low as possible? Uh, there's a lot of complexity in getting it right. So there's people and the founders and when they turn up, what happens in Australia, what happens in the US, um, onboarding um, into the um, share plan rules. Uh, and and the, the complexities in dealing with two jurisdictions, I think is one of the real challenges that people um, have. And founders just want to move fast and just, uh, I've got some you know, good, good clients that have told me, we just want you to, Make sure we don't get burnt. Like, we just want to go fast. Don't want to get burnt. That's your that's your job. Make sure we don't get burnt. Um, but we don't want to have something that's so complicated it's unworkable as well. So you've got to trade off and, and know what what the right speed is and what the right systems are and what, how how to integrate the systems that we're already working with in Australia and that don't apply in the US. So how do we work out which ones we need to adopt and, and which new ones we need to find as well? So then communication and what sort of stuff, culture, they're, they're, they're it's probably some of the, the key things and some time zone issues as well. Yeah. That's, you know, you can't, you've got to have common, you've got to have at least two or three hours to get a common time zone to make sure you've got multiple uh, locations team once. Yeah, and I don't think a lot of founders think about that. You know, time zones, it's quite, especially in Australia here, if you want to contact people in Europe, it's, you, know, you get maybe one or two hours a day where it's actually a decent time to communicate with staff and people like that as well. So it's a really good point. And also a good point is don't break the law. Um, but, you know, yeah, certain countries have certain restrictions, regulations, regulations. So that's, a, that's a definitely a big thing. Um, so I'll move on to last year. With your experience, what do you think businesses should consider before they actually expand globally? So I'll touch on something that's broader and then I'll touch on something specific. So the broad thing first is in entering any new market, I think a business is well placed to first test its product market fit for that market. I think before investing resources, time and effort into a aggressive sales or marketing effort, you should first make sure that your product is truly fit for the market and customer needs in that market. And we generally say no two markets are the same, so you do need to test each time you're entering a new overseas market. And so uh, I'll give you an example for a business. Let's say you're selling some kind of uh, hospital management software. You might have a long sales cycle for something like that. So it's a B2B product, long sales cycle, but a big deal size. Perhaps you would then run some pilots, which you would hope to convert into ongoing paid business. And, uh, you know, it's that conversion of those pilots that tells you that you have found your product market fit. Whereas if you're not really landing those pilots or you're not really converting them into ongoing business, that would be indicative that you maybe need to make some changes to your product. And that's not a bad thing. You know, it's quite common that businesses do need to tweak their products when entering new markets. 
And then going to the more specific thing, this is um, something that's not always thought of because it doesn't really seem like the first priority for an expanding business, but your IP strategy, really think about that at the same time as you plan your expansion. In some markets, um, the IP system, like it may be a first to file system for trademarks, where it's actually the first entity to file for that trademark, gets the trademark rather than the first entity that has used that trademark in any context globally. So in some markets, it's quite common for there to be trademark supporters and they may see, you know, this Australian company has been ASX listed. We can see that they've spoken in their prospectus about growth plans. We're going to squat on their trademark. We're going to register this and then they'll have to buy it out from us or, you know, there may be even counterfeiting. So that could be a significant mm. issue. It's just something that you need to keep in mind. And there are some great people at IP Australia and there are also various legal advisors around the world who are pretty much dedicated to helping businesses avoid these pitfalls. Yeah, that's a really good point as well. And I don't think that is a point that generally when you start a business, you're going to think about trademarking straight away. Um, so very good point. Um, now I'll move to you, Nick. I've got two part question for you. So one on the first, speaking from your personal experience, what considerations did you have to think about when you personally went and worked out of the UK, the US and Asia? That's part one. I think, I think the honest answer is as, as, a, as an entrepreneur, probably not enough for them. Um, and I think, as we all know, when you're trying to get a business up and running and, and moving, um, there's always that balance between risk and reward. So, you know, certainly, um, it's certainly the first um, you know, the first time gone to markets. I think with the benefit of hindsight, there's things that we can share around that you learn. But, um, you know, the, the, the two things that I've always been really clear about, one is the why. We talked about that at the beginning. You've got to have a why. Um, it's not just about having a, another office on your website. Um, you've got to understand there's a market there. And I think, the, and I think market validation is really key. Um, for, for, for me, in terms of when we've done it, so we say, well, it's whether that's been the customer pool, whether it's partners, whether it's seeing evidence um, on the ground, I think you've got to really got to know that there's something there for you to land on. Um, I think the, um, yeah, I think that those are the kind of the main considerations I have, and probably when we talk about the next uh, half of the question, we talk about some of the things that I probably wish that we had thought about before we, before we launched into the markets. Yep. So the second question is yeah. so, uh, about your role as an investor. So what yeah. do you say to those startups who are looking to go global as putting your investor hat on? Yeah. What am I saw? What would you say to them? Yeah. And, 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 I think that's, and I think that's broadly reflective of some of the comments. That, yeah. you know, I think that we, as investors, we love businesses that are international and have growth potential. So um, we're always going to back the founders' aspirations. I think there's, there's probably three categories from personal experience that, um, that are, 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 can be unexpected for founders. And one is the... Uh, the resourcing requirements uh, required to set up a, a, a new business. And that's not just talking about the resource on the ground in the country moving to, it's actually the impact on your head office. So you really are probably more than doubling the workload across the whole business. So you've got to be prepared for that um, and make sure you're funded for it. If you're just, if you're thinking you can just take a couple of people from your office here and put them somewhere else and that's going to work. Um, I think you're probably fooling yourself. You know, you need to make sure you've got the proper resource around um, around it. Um, and alongside that, there's a communication challenge that we've all talked about. And I think it's uh, it's very easy for a, uh, for a small team in the head office to be bouncing ideas around. Things are changing a million miles an hour, and there's someone then there's someone stuck out in a different time zone is missing all of that. Um, I think I think COVID's changed some of that. I think we're all getting better at communicating remotely now, but that can be a real challenge for, for people. Culture critical, just because they speak the same language and seem to be facing the same problems doesn't mean the culture isn't very, very, um, very, very different. So you've got to be mindful of the cultural challenges. Um, and then finally, coming back to, to take a start point is legal and, and, and tax. You know, that is, it, 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 again, it might look and feel the same because it's a similar type of economy, but it, it probably isn't. And you've got to be really careful. Um, you've got to be really careful to get that, that right. Yeah, definitely. And I think um, just to preface why, how this session came about as well is because, you know, like um, Nick just mentioned, remote working is now becoming the norm. So now with remote working becoming more, the norm, founders and startups are now looking at expanding globally. And a lot of the questions is, well, how do I do that? And that's why the session um, is here today. So on that topic, though, we want to talk about common mistakes and pitfalls as well. 
So founders have done it. They've been there. You know, they've done it for years now, and there's definitely some lessons to be learned here as well. So, David, let's start with you. Um, what mistakes have you seen startups make when they've tried to expand overseas? Everyone breaking the law. <laughs> <laughs> Every mistake uh, from setting up too early, setting up the wrong structures, setting up uh, in the wrong states, not understanding um, cultural issues, how to go to market issues. Uh, Communication issues, every everything. But I mean, focusing on some of the things that they've got right probably is is you know slowing down to work out where should they go, what is there, um, yeah, where, where how do they manage the, the issue with okay, we're going to start selling in the US. What's our structure? We're using uh, sales and marketing approach, or are, we, are they doing uh, helping us with content, or what what's their role to make sure we don't trigger unnecessary tax problems? How do we um, manage which states should we be in in terms of high tax rates, um, just answering some of the tax things, um, using subsidiaries when they're about to do a flip up as well, and then you've got these you know, complexities that need to be unraveled before an investor will probably come on. Um, but they're just, they're mainly operational things to be honest, like just the communication and making sure you lose that and you sort of touch on the, um, just the key things around operations and understanding um, and getting those key systems right, like uh, they're using Notion and having you know, meetings where they've got that common time that they can get together and say, what's what's going to stop us getting this done this week? And then at the end of the week, you're know, having a chat about, well, these are the things we had to get done and these are the, this is, so we're on track. So getting the integration of all of the pieces of uh, you know, building your engineering and sales and marketing and product people and getting all of those things working Unison, so that they can you know, demonstrate that you're making really effective use of the capital you've been given, because uh, it's going to cost you money to build a product. Um, yeah, unless you're bootstrapping, of course. But even then, some things cost money, uh, and particularly in working in remote teams, working out that if you're offering things like options, for example, do you know the rules? Like, if I've, I've had people saying, "Well, I've given these people options," well, they're, they're living in Bali or they're living in. Um, Ukraine or they're living in you know, all these different countries and so well, you're, you're breaching you know, laws of their country by doing that with well, triggering tax and not entitled to these benefits of the Australian or US plans that aren't suitable for this. Uh, so you've got to unravel, give them the bad news. And the last thing you really want to do is create tax problems for the, your most valuable assets, which are your people who want to build that, build that company. So every mistake and it's just about working where are they at and try to find out which one, what assumptions have they made that are right and wrong. So tip them upside down and have a chat <laughs> about what their thoughts are. See if you can help them a little bit more. Right. Last up, make less mistakes. Yeah. Well, you live and you learn, right? And uh, yeah, I, made a mistake. <laughs> I made a mistake because I skipped a question. <laughs> <laughs> I was, we were supposed to talk about um, strategies on how to expand overseas before we spoke about the um, pitfalls and mistakes. That's okay, we'll come back get to that. Let's get we'll mistakes out of the way get first. Get mistakes out of the way first, <laughs> and then, then let's see how we can um, start, use strategies to expand. So I'll refer back to our last year. Nick, now, do you have any other additions that you'd like to add to David's comments on common mistakes and pitfalls? Yeah, one mistake can be underestimating the amount of time it takes to enter a really complex market. Take, for example, we often do as a general rule of thumb, just say to clients that you should account for at least 12 months to start getting some early traction in the US. And um, I mean, there can obviously be different cases where you're getting the full from the market, but this is just, you know, a conservative estimate. And so if you don't have the cash runway to sustain you through that time, then you're going to find yourself in a very difficult spot that could be hard to come back from. Um, another thing is also, um, I guess you do need to balance short-term opportunities and your long-term strategy and not every opportunity you come across will actually drive you towards your long-term strategy. So sometimes that does mean turning down opportunities that you don't think are in your long-term best interest. So let's say you've started entering the US market, you're that business, or maybe a different business, you're, you're a compliance solution for, again, the medical industry. And so you've started to get a few pilots going in that particular space 
And then you see a tender for a massive government project in the utilities sector. Now trying to put some significant development time into changing your product to be able to really deliver on that project. You have to think, um, is this opportunity going to really make an impact for my business in terms of my long-term strategy? There may be some reasons why you go after that in the shorter term, like if you need a cash injection that that project may provide to survive as a business, but really, um, you should be taking opportunities that will drive you towards where you want to be long term as a business. And that does mean sometimes being conservative with your resources because spreading yourself too thin, trying to serve many different customer types and doing that poorly is much worse than focusing on one core customer group and doing that really, really well. Yeah, 100% agree with that comment. But yeah, founders that go down that rabbit hole and over here and then down that, it destabilizes how much money you got, destabilizes belief in the founder that they're chasing all these other ideas and um, it's just that, that consistency of managing your capital and really being very measured about you know the, the speed the direction you go with you know, the you know the analysis of what are the key steps you know that's that's so important and, uh, sticking to that and really just almost saying no which is that strategic stuff that i thought yeah that's really good I mean, a lot of the things that you're saying, it's also not just relevant to when you're expanding into the global market, it's relevant here, even if you're just a startup in the one country, in the one city, all the things you're saying now are also relevant as well. Nick, did you have anything to add to that? Um, I think, well, it's, it's a good thing as founders, we don't get scared off by making mistakes, isn't it? Because there's <laughs> plenty of things that can go wrong. And, and I think to your point, Lisa, they can go wrong locally as well as internationally. And I, and I think you know, if I look back at from personal experience, um, I definitely couldn't have achieved what I achieved without going internationally. So the, the prize is huge, it's real, and it's, um, but equally, um, some of the hardest times I've had as China have been through that, through that international development. So I think, and that coming back to David's point, at the heart of that is, is, is legal and, and tax. And you've got to be, particularly in Asia, uh, you've got to be super careful. Some countries, laws are, are not really black and white they're, they're 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 very very ambiguous and as a foreign company coming in uh, you can be exposed to local competitors tapping on someone's shoulder and saying we need to have a you should have a look at this company and foreign companies can be the ones they want to hold up as someone that's broken um broken a law that doesn't necessarily exist so, so i think the legal uh you know the legal side is is kind of super important that you go in with your eyes open you're playing all the sporting analogy, you're playing on a away ground, it's not a home ground. So don't you know don't be naive to think that everyone's gonna welcome you uh, with open arms and just and just make sure you've thought through some of those and, and don't give anyone an excuse to to, to, to come after you basically because you because you haven't done the right thing, just, even not knowingly. And just the the you know, to add to that, most people are experts in their, their area. Yeah. But to be going into two countries or being having a foot in two countries, you almost need to be an expert on both countries because the wrong advice here, uh, the right advice here may not be the right answer here. So you've got to be able to work out if I do this in the US, will that work in Australia too? And structures like you know, using trust is a good example. The US don't really like trust. They have this regime called grantor trust. And so everyone in Australia has been told, use a trust because you have assets and you have income tax concession, et cetera, but the US have a very different view in their PPIC rules and subpart F rules and their, uh, all their, their guilty legislation, et cetera. It's just, it's so complicated. There'd be very few people in the US that would actually have any command of what's it like for an Australian moving to the US? Because there's just, there's 350 odd million people there, but how many Australian customers have they got? And we've got, if you're operating in two jurisdictions, that's another level of expertise. And, Almost everyone doesn't have. Oh, true, some great points. Now, before we go back to the question on strategies and how to expand overseas, and then we also touch on some case studies as well, which I know everyone's looking forward to. We have a question um, from our virtual audience here, which I'm going to ask. Um, so if you have a US person that wants to invest, do you need to set up a US entity or can you provide them with the proper reporting documents so they can invest in an Australian entity? Got that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, well, that, that's um, first of all, in terms of capital raising, I assume you're talking about 
the Corporations Act and the rules there. So um, you, you don't need to have a prospectus if you're going to keep your, your offer very tight to be raising money for so there's some self-funding concessions. You can't have more than 50 shareholders unless you're a public company. Uh, but to offer, there's no rules against it's using the example US investing in the Australian company. Uh, as far as corporations are concerned, but you, if you start to raise a lot of money, you need to start thinking, and it's a good idea generally to get a concession or a, or a notification that that person is someone who's regarded as a wholesale or sophisticated investor so that you get almost a, a blanket concession to say, we're raising money for people that should be allowed to invest. That's also important for things like uh, ESIC um, because they can invest a certain amount of money if they're, if they're not uh, the, the, um, a wholesale investor versus a, versus a retail investor. So yes, you can take money from US investors. Uh, they then have their own rules about saying, is that a company going to check the box? But most startups don't make money until the very end anyway. Uh, so yes, you can take money from US uh, citizens. They can invest. However, there have been some new rules that have come in recently, which are making it increasingly difficult to take money from US investors because of the reporting requirements. And things, um, so if you Google things like FATCA, F-A-T-C-A, uh, and um, there's another rule that's come in recently and it's just escaped uh, my mind what it's called, but there are a lot more complexities and reporting. So I know that some of the accelerators aren't taking money from or allowing even people living in Australia that are actually dual citizens, so they're citizens of the US, is you never lose that unless you renounce. So yes, it's becoming harder to take money from US and there's just all, all those different rules. So there's the US rules, the, the FATCA rules, there's the Australian rules, there's the, um, you know, then they've got to sign shareholders agreements. It's, it's really hard raising money. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen how many, you know, how, how long documents are, are getting these days. Great. Right. Well, I hope that answered your question very in depth there. Um, okay, so we'll come back to the questions um, from the session today, going back to strategies on how to expand overseas. Uh, so last year, I'll start with you. So Australian networks provide assistance to helping startups uh, with search market strategies in international markets, right? So can you talk to a couple and explain what the result was? Sure thing. Um, so I'll just preface by saying that both these case studies, uh, I'm sharing them with client permission given from having uh, published these case studies previously on our website and through other media, so I can speak about these. Um, one case study I'd like to talk about is um, a company that we supported through the Singapore landing pad called Awakened Mind, and basically they have a, a corporate e-learning platform for the create corporate e-learning modules rather for employees to help them practice mindfulness and cope with stress. And so Awakened Mind, they already had a couple of multinational corporations as customers in Australia before they started feeling a pull to Southeast Asia. And that's when we kind of stepped in and assisted Awakened Mind. And basically uh, the key learning, I guess, from their experience that I wanted to share was that they found that certain channels to market work in international markets where they haven't really worked in Australia. So um, to give uh, more specificity around that, Awakened Mind, they found a distributor that aggregated their content onto an existing e-learning platform in Singapore. And that strategy worked with quite a bit of success in Singapore, whereas they, the founder, uh, Julian, he had remarked that in Australia, they hadn't found a similar model working for them. So that's an example of how uh, in markets abroad, you can find new channels to market that don't necessarily have the same results for you in Australia. And I've seen quite a few companies work with resellers and value-added resellers in the Southeast Asia region. Another example, um, this company, they entered the US market and they went through our San Francisco learning pad program a couple of years ago called Fathom. They're an AI platform that helps governments and organizations measure the impacts of various global trends on their workforces and they can 
help uh, these parties uh, predict how to upskill and reskill their workforce to meet new demands of businesses moving forward. And so Fathom Bay in the US market, which is a complex beast to enter, they found that tapping into networks of expat Australians really, really helped them. They were able to get contact with Australian expats who occupied great positions in corporates and in businesses in the US and that, that really having that Australian influence and kinship really helped them build those foundations, which they've continued to build upon um, over the subsequent years. So those are two examples of things you can do, you know, consider other channels to market in new markets and also tap into the Australian, the existing Australian networks that are available to you in those markets because they are very, very helpful. Great, right, fantastic. And how about you, Nick? What strategies have you seen work? I think um, the world's changed a lot since, but probably since some of the international work I've done. I think one of the things that we, we're spending a lot of time with some of the companies we're working with, and it doesn't apply to, to everyone, but certainly uh, if you're a software SaaS business, um, it, it's really thinking about what you can do before you have to, we've talked sort of a lot about some of the challenges of actually setting up a physical operation overseas, but actually a lot of other companies now can build really true, truly global user base through, through some product led growth. So that's really thinking about what can you do with your product uh, to take away some of the challenges of selling, uh, supporting, uh, user learning. And we've all seen a million examples of you know, DocuSign, uh, DocSend, Dropbox, all these companies, um, you know, they, they, they build truly global businesses before they actually need to put people on the ground in a lot of cases. Um, and that's because the product does the work for you. So I think, I think uh, sort of slightly counterintuitively, you know, one of the things, if you can, you should think about uh, how you can get the product to do the work before you physically have to go and do it. You still need to validate the opportunities in different markets, but really, really, really think about that. And I think a lot of companies are, um, are, are getting, and there's some great reading on it now for those who are less familiar with it um, around that. But it's really, really worthwhile going through that exercise. I mean, for those, when you do need to land in the country, you know, I guess as we said before, that the, for me, the main consideration is to make sure you take advantage of a lot of the, the resources that exist now and the advice you can get now that you probably couldn't get a few years ago. And the, the government's very supportive. There's, there's money, there's help, there's networks, and, and, and really make sure you tap into those. You know, it's not, it doesn't make sense to try and do it yourself. Um, and I think, you know, we, it's, it's changed a lot now. And then um, like, I think what I gained for the conversation we've had so far is each, as we know, it's very obvious that each startup and founder is for individual and unique circumstances. Um, so not one, it's not a one size fit all. Right, but I think the from what points you've met right today, I think there's a lot of points there where a lot of founders didn't think about. So I think it's a, some good, some good insights there um, from our panelists today. So we've got about 15 minutes left. Great. Uh, there's a couple of questions here. See here, if we've got time, I'll definitely go through it. Anyone in the audience, if you have any questions, please let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to continue on to our next session talking about um, case studies, uh, more case studies, which I think you'll want to hear about as well. So if I could ask the panelists to perhaps share one case study you know of who has expanded into global markets, that is how, did, how they did it, what lessons were learned, I'm sure our audience uh, would be grateful to hear. So I might start with you, Nick, you can talk about your own or business that sure, working. Sure, Let me talk about my own because that's probably the one I'm <laughs> most, most familiar with. And we talked a little bit before about a business where um, you know, we had a very deliberate strategy that did involve us landing in a number of different countries across Asia um, to, to build something that we thought was you know, had a big moat around it and was going to be very valuable um, for some. So we so we you know we clearly set out with that strategy. Um, you know we certainly made sure that there was a, a as much client pull as possible. Throughout we talked about that. You know there's no point just landing in a country because you think you want to be there if no one's uh, no one's really wants to buy the product or solution you have there. So. Uh, but if I, if I think about the things that um, I think were really important for that strategy to, to work for us, um, it, one was to have a, an absolute commitment from a resourcing perspective. So we had a, uh, we had a management team of four, an HQ in Sydney, um, and two of that team moved to Singapore. And that was a, was a really clear statement, uh, both, both to us and to our customers, 
um, that were not just an Australian business, were, you know, were serious about Asia, yeah. were putting people in there, and the customers noticed that and the staff noticed that. So I think, I think um, and that's probably one of the first things, you know, any startup that's putting people overseas, is that number one, that number one hire um, is quite often successful or failure. So you, know, you might want to think about whether that's one of your founding team to make sure you're transplant, transplanting a, a culture because uh, if you're bringing in someone from the outside, uh, there's some risk around that. So, so getting that, you know, I think making the statement quite often there's a founding or founder partner might have to make make that move themselves. And we did that with uh, uh, we did that with that business. So, so you know, very focused on getting the resource on the ground, um, really focused on on culture. Um, you know, we made it pretty quickly. We made it clear that the. Sydney was no longer really the HQ, so we didn't have that kind of HQ satellite model. Um, you know, we made all the businesses feel that they were um, super important and had their own resource and everything else. We didn't have the problems around people putting their hands up and saying we can't get stuff done because it only gets done um, in HQ. So, 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 so culture was a um, was a was a was a really big one for us as well. But yeah, I think I mean ultimately, and of course the. You know, the legal and the structure. So we ended up in six countries with seven entities. So some of the stuff that Dave has been talking about, um, you know, lots of challenges around making sure that we understood implications of transfer pricing and, and various tax and, and tax rebates you can get there. So so you end up spending more and more of your time on that side of the um, of getting that side of the coin right, particularly if you think you're going to sell the business. Because when it, when someone comes to diligence a business like that, they're going to look at every single entity. They're going to be doing diligence on every single entity you've got for tax, for legal, for employment law, for everything else. So so you've got to be really mindful that you get that um, get that right. And we, we were pretty focused with compliance business at heart. So luckily we have that compliance DNA yeah. in what we're doing. But it was really important because that you know still created challenges when it comes to diligence. Right. Uh, well, I can't think of too many um, specific examples that are really powerful as, as big comets. Um, and they're one of their first, they almost sometimes refer to him as their third, their third founder, a guy called Robert Alvarez, who was a COO, became a COO and CFO of big commerce. Um, he was in Austin. He had, um, yeah, I think he'd, he'd been involved with about four companies before this. and. Um, it, all of them have been sold, like every one has been sold. And, um, and by the way, I've got permission, I think, because uh, he, he was on my podcast. Um, <laughs> so I'm just really just sharing one of the stories that he told on the podcast. And um, so he became this, this first person. He really looked at, um, you know, really told the guys, look, we need to start thinking about can we lost and let's really build the landing pad over in the US. And so gradually, you know, when you're operating two teams and deciding, my building here and then managing IP here and managing um, you know, my sales and marketing, my general administration people and my R&D, getting that right uh, and hiring the best possible people, which is the point that really resonated with me and reminded me, I guess, of uh, Robert, which is um, he, he really reinvented the way that they hired at e-commerce through two different processes, which is uh, not just looking at the skills on he calls that bucket one, uh, so you're looking at, you know, can this person do the job? Are they likely to be able to do the job? But he, he calibrated this other thing called bucket two, which is around, are they a good fit for the team? Are they, are they humor, uh, do they uh, have uh, humility? I think you point it ambitious. I thought I love that. I think I'm, I'm interviewing this bloke. I think this is a bloody good podcast. I'm actually the guy interviewing. Um, and so just the, the key thing was just getting the right people. And every single one of this is, is just something that Eddie had, mentioned to, um, to to Robert, why is everyone that you're hiring always our best people? And well, this is bucket two, but this is how I think about getting the right people. It's not just what they can do, but what sort of people they are. And, and he said, from now on, everything is, we're changing the entire way we hire people with this approach to bucket one and bucket two. So I think getting the, the hiring and the, the culture right is the key to everything else. I mean, nothing else is more important than that. Um, and then being on that team myself, uh, and uh, even in uh, you know, the, the, the biggest uh, event in my lifetime, or most of our lifetime, we, uh, we managed to uh, see the company get listed on NASDAQ. Uh, it was the most oversubscribed stock in the last five years, uh, which is pretty impressive. So. Uh, so that's that's definitely one of my, my 
faves. Um, and maybe the second one is really um, one which is a bit bittersweet, which is I, I back these guys very, I won't, I won't mention their name, I back them very early in the piece. Um, and they're, they're over on uh, the East Coast now, Sydney and, um, uh, and in, I'll just say East Coast, uh, the US. And uh, I'm having a chat about the, the next raise and they're going, oh, Dave, look, you know, this new VC has said, look, you know, we need to pull back some of the early angel investors and oh, I hate to ask, but would you not take all your follow on rights? I'm going, you bastards. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, like there's, there's those sort of stories that, you know, you go, you're killing it, you're loving the fact that you're getting the product right and then uh, doing all those sorts of things well. And uh, so managing, managing the teams and, and even one founder going up to the US and one staying in Australia, working out how do you manage your own team and is this generous tax concession, but you've still got to be in losses in Australia to get the full benefit. So after you add back the R&D costs, because you can't double dip in every category, you're still going to be in losses. And then but if we're doing work in the US, and I'm not talking now about that one, but if we're doing R&D work or core work and development in, um, the, in the foreign jurisdiction, that starts to muddy the waters about, well, you probably can't claim that. If you're doing the work in Australia, but the IPs in the US, is selling that over to the uh, to the, uh, the foreign company as a result, using up all losses, and then we're raising more money. And we're saying, well, every time we raise more money, then we go and test whether or not we've got the losses still, because the losses only can be carried forward if we have, you know, uh, the, the continuity of ownership. We have more than fifty percent of the people are there when those losses are incurred. So it gets super complicated getting all these things right, and then and being able to explain, guess what we're going to do with uh, this other thing called international dealing schedule and they go I'm just trying to make some money I'm a simple you know software engineer and you've got to explain these massive massive complexities so um, I think getting it right across the jurisdictions is really hard but you know it's it's you know if you get uh, it right it's very rewarding as um, some of those examples mm -hmm. and I'm, I'm still I'm still hoping that I get a little bit more follow <laughs> fingers crossed for you fingers crossed <laughs> about, you know, yes. yeah but I can, um, from the two or well, the three case studies that um, you've brought up so far, the key consideration or the key thing that keeps popping up is people, people and culture, and like getting the founder over there and making sure that you actually have you know, a, a good, um, what's the word? What word am I looking for? Good foundation. Yes, good game plan, but good foundations. So when you're starting your country, you want to make sure that is exactly the company that Absolutely. you're your startup, your business, and that's how you're going to run it from there. So it's a lot harder when you don't have an investment or you're not invested in the company itself. Um, last year, I'll go to you. I know you've given us a couple of case studies, case studies already, so thank you. Do you have any more that you'd like to share with us during the session? Yeah, sure. I'll share the case study. Again, a company that expanded into the US, a very complex and large market. Um, the company is Runtify. Again, we've got a full case study on our website that you can read if you're interested after I give you the rundown. But um, Gruntify, basically, they have a app that helps field workers plug data back into a control, manager, a control panel for their managers to then um, be able to assign tasks and to view what's happening across field sites. And so Gruntify, they had uh, already established themselves in Australia. They'd worked with the Queensland government on Cyclone Debbie emergency response. And then they recognized that there'd be an opportunity in the US because the US also from various parts to natural disasters. And so they started to make the move over to the US. Mm -hmm. And the founder of Gruntify shared in this case study three key learnings. The first was to be quite intentional to know what your objectives are for a particular market. Are you going into capital raise? Are you going in to uh, grow your business in that market? Then build your plan and remember that choice and stick to that plan. What they also advised was to consider different channels to market. Um, and this touches on one of my previous case studies. I didn't really delve further into, I guess, why distributors or resellers can sometimes be uh, valuable to a business and that's because sometimes they have networks that you just don't have and they've been operating that space for a very long time and sometimes they are able to also provide you with some of the 
market knowledge you need to be able to localize your product effectively for a customer base in a new market. So those are some of the value adds that they can have. So Brontify did work with distributors. They also were quite strategic in picking partners in the US market that could help them better understand and sell to government clients. Because as many of you or some of you may have um, experienced, when you're selling to government, you really need to go through a process of building up trust as well. And it's a, it can be a long process. So having those strategic partners that already sold to government help them understand some of the approaches they needed to make. And third, that third piece of advice was to be prepared to make some product tweaks, which is something we've also touched upon. So yeah, you can read the full case study if you're interested. It's on our landing pads or website. Great, fantastic. And we'll have all the information in the post event email to offer those. And the recording will also be available as post event recording as well. Now we've only got four minutes left, and like I said, I'm really I'm stick of the time. You love that mirror. Um, I just want to ask the panelists just one final question about the future for global startups. Um, so we'll need to keep the questions the answers a bit short and to stick to time. But what do you see happening in the near future for startups with a global view? So especially with this global pandemic now, we might be on the, the outside of it now, almost there. Do you see the continued increase of globalization of businesses, or do you think businesses, startups, and corporates alike will trend towards regionalization, regionalization. I want to go first. I'll go first. Um, <laughs> so obviously it depends on, on, on where you sit, but I, I, I certainly imagine if you're if you're if you're a key part of a physical supply chain or you're involved in um, something that seems deemed as somewhat some, somewhat uh, strategic for countries now, as we've all discovered through COVID, you're Probably going to be quite localized in terms of your outcome. I think the, the my, my view is that the globalization, um, you know, if anything, the pand pandemic has, has torn up a whole load of rule books. Um, we don't really, even the concept of an office now, people being together is um, it is really quite, we've got used to not dealing with that. So, so, so my view is that every single business out there um, that's managed to thrive through a pandemic when we can't get on a plane. Um, it should be thinking about the whole world as their market now anyway, um, whether they get a need to go on the plane or not. So I think I think that kind of anytime, anywhere um, is gonna is gonna particularly your software business is gonna be really critical. So I think globalization is definitely there to stay. Yep, I agree and I completely I think in my opinion I also think that globalization is actually going to increase more than anything, but I'd like to yeah. hear uh, what you all think. So last one. Yeah, well, I mean, the IMF is predicting that this year world trade will bounce back 8.1%. I mean, that doesn't speak to digital trade specifically, but one aspect of trade that has been very negatively impacted by COVID has been services trade, and that's because it's the limited mobility of people to deliver those services. Again, it's hard to distill how much of that would be digital services. Yeah. But one thing we have seen for sure is that the need for digital transformation in businesses has risen. And I mean, the Australian government's recently put aside $800 million to help businesses digitally transform. And that's to help Australia's economic recovery through the creation of jobs and by helping these businesses grow and digitize. And so I definitely think that this creates a very great environment for tech startups. And just speaking anecdotally, tech startups that I have worked with have told me that they've found it sometimes easier to get a foot in the Zoom or WebEx or whatever platform you use, the meeting room online, where previously they would have had to travel to the market to be able to get that same meeting. But that doesn't necessarily mean that closing the deal is any easier. And that's something to keep in mind. The same fundamentals apply. You need to be able to prove your business to them. You need to be able to really make your case, pitch yourself, demonstrate product market fit. The need for all those things haven't gone anywhere, so great. Yeah. And David, thoughts globalization versus regionalization? Oh, I think they're both going to happen when you've got is you've got the wake up call about uh, sovereign risk in terms of supply chain and critical things that we need to have. Um, so there'll be people that are capturing a piece of that, that pie, uh, and then looking at uh, the, the what I think we've learned in the last 12 months is that. If you, if we really do need to not necessarily take capital for granted and, and working out uh, how you're managing a win-win scenario with all of your stakeholders, from your, from your investors, your staff, your customers, and your suppliers, and really work that through. I think it's been a good wake-up call. I think the, the, the great founders have actually made modifications to their, their operating models and, and their, 
either hired more in the areas and let people go in other areas and then they've just adapted and sort of uh, made it happen. I, I think as much as the government's helping it all over the world in lots of different ways, uh, the founders are still working out how to navigate all of the benefits they can find, but they're saying, I can't just rely on those benefits and I can find things myself and be able to integrate with other startup founders and ecosystems and learn and adapt and evolve. So I think that there's going to be some really great companies that we're going to hear of. Um, I know of a few that I've uh, been working with already that are coming uh, up and, and, and really doing some spectacular things. So I think there's just, there's going to be more. There's just going to be more global business, uh, more opportunities, more people that are, that are doing well, making money. A lot of the, and a lot of this has come back from a lot of the founders who've had exits from some of these you know, forerunners that have had you know, a series that have been having, able to sell out and list and you know so many founders that have taken money off the table that have these are the real you know, operational experts in these areas and these in these niches that are getting involved in other companies and that 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 information is really the lifeblood of you know some future winners as well you know so. I think if we're in for uh, an interesting year, I think it's going to be, um, I wouldn't, wouldn't tell you what's happening with all the prices and things, but I think founders will always, you know, I've had founders, I think they always find a way. Yeah, great. And what a note to uh, finish up on today. So thank you again to everyone who's um, joined us today, including our panellists, David, Lavia and Nick. Um, we This session is recorded. You can catch a recording on our website tankstreamlabs.com or at our YouTube uh, channel as well at tankstreamlabs. We run this um, every month so join us for the next session. More details to come on our website but again thank you to our panellists and thank you those who are here today. Very exciting to see real, real, <laughs> real people. <laughs> and thank you to everyone who's joined us virtually as well and we'll see you at the next Global Startup Series session.